Jillian, thank you so much for being back on Data Talk and super excited to catch up with you. So first, I wanted to just check in to see how are you doing? Uh, last time we chatted, it wasn't the pandemic, but now we've been a full year into COVID-19 and just kind of curious how you've been doing. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Mike. It's great to be on the show. And yeah, it's been a lot of changes since I guess we last spoke. Um, We've been doing quite well, I think, um, all things considered. Um, a number of our team did actually fall sick, including myself, with COVID. So that was a challenge during the early days. But um, we're really feeling positive about the roadmap ahead and kind of the progress in the UK. And looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, for sure. How did you find um, when... A lot of countries went into lockdown and a lot of people had to begin working remotely. I was kind of curious about like your your work and as you worked with different teams, did you notice any sort of changes in how you communicated and how you worked with them? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think because we're a tech company, we're a little bit well suited for remote working, although it wasn't something that we did completely. So there was definitely some adjustments that happened. Um, especially with different regions, um, like our team in, in Germany, again, just kind of looking at the different stages and, and considerations of different people who are maybe joining in or what kind of, um, you know, things were going on in their world to, to consider. Um, but it's interesting because I have uh, I was approached by a publisher so on this particular topic. So I'm actually writing a book that should be available at the end of uh, summer uh, called Wired Influence. And it is about how we can look at, um, again, how technology is influencing us, but how we can make that work um, in a kind of remote working situation and how we can leverage that as well to look at our wider impact and long-term kind of digital footprint. So we'd be happy to share more once that's available. Oh my gosh. That is like huge news. So, uh, were you, that's like super cool. Yeah. Did you, uh, when, when did you get this idea to start writing wired influence? Well, I was approached about the opportunity because of, I think the unique position of being in a tech company and, um, looking at how that model could be replicated um, to maybe more traditional knowledge workers who would have been in an office. Um, and I think there is an interesting relationship with technology. You know, there's a lot of conversations and documentaries about, again, kind of the, the influences and impact on our lives. And certainly running a tech company puts you in a position where you can't ever really break away from technology as you're building and, and creating and designing it. But it certainly makes you a lot more aware of its impact and how, again, you can become a lot more mindful of its presence and use and the distractions and potentially, you know, uh, consequences if you're not really paying attention to it. Well, this is awesome. And um, I want to be the first podcast to make sure we're covering your book. Uh, can't wait to read that. Um, so another thing I want to check up with you on is the Safe in the City app. How is that going? I'd love to hear any details you can share. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've had a lot of changes, I guess, since we last spoke. Um, so I think most recently we, um, you know, with COVID, clearly there was a lot of people that had now been in lockdown. The kind of need for navigation on a day-to-day -day basis became quite low. So we really had to come together as a team and understand, okay, what is you know, we definitely know that there's still a problem. There will per persist to be a problem after the pandemic. So what's our, at the core? And I think what we came to was, you know, really it is the data and it is looking at the representation of more uh, safety needs and considerations for different groups. So from that, uh, we developed our I3 intelligence, uh, which we can go into a little bit later, but just as a, a teaser, um, it's basically taking kind of the, the brains behind Safe in the City, the expertise, the algorithms, the data that we've collected or established relationships um, with different partners to then make it available for other mobile apps to plug in 
um, as again, we see technology um, so interconnected in our lives and especially with mobile devices, when we're in public spaces, the, the need that actually safety information um, and functionality is something that we should really consider um, so that we are gathering information, but we're also providing as much information to keep people safe and informed. And um, really quickly, for those listening in who haven't heard the previous podcast where we went into detail about the Safe of the City app, can you just briefly explain for those that haven't heard about it, what your app does and the sort of data you're collecting? Absolutely. So Safe in the Cities app, and definitely go listen to the other podcast. It goes into much more detail. It was a fantastic conversation. But uh, the app is basically very much designed like a navigation app. So getting people from A to B. Um, so we made it look very similar to kind of the standard navigation apps, Google, Apple Maps, City Mapper. So you, when you plot in your destination, it does look a little bit differently. Um, so we do have kind of an emergency button that you can um, connect to at any point if you're witnessing a crime or maybe you're experiencing something. Um, and then as you're guided through the um, journey, if that's whether it's on public transport or it's walking, uh, you can actually get prompts on certain risks that have been um, patterned over the over the years um, in particular areas to help uh, guide you through these, um, I guess, potential risks and feel a lot more empowered to make uh, decisions around your personal safety so you can make course corrections along the way. Uh, we also alert to any emergency information that happens. So if there's a terrorist attack or something, a fire in your way, um, we again kind of make sure that anyone and everyone that is going through that area is again um, provided with that accurate um, factual information to keep themselves safe. Um, and then people uh, score their journey based on their perception of safety so that we can also understand what different people may ex might experience through walking around different places. Um, you and I might have a very different idea or history with, with personal safety issues or concerns. Um, so we might have a very different scoring. Um, and that algorithm is looking at then how can we help design routes that better suit your needs. And then finally, we do have a crowdsourced functionality, almost like kind of ways where you can, the community crowdsources information related to street harassment or any particular unsafe experiences that they also would like it to be improved. And that we again, um, collate at a, an aggregate level. So it's anonymous and we're looking, we're most interested in looking at those trends over time, particular spaces that might have you know, a certain number of maybe groping or touching or maybe racial and um, her verbal harassment. And then we can look at, um, you know, the solutions that we can collaborate with police, with different maybe business districts, with community um, and city officials so that we are continuously building uh, safer, more inclusive spaces. That's fantastic, Jillian. It's been about a year since the launch of the app of Safe in the City. What are some interesting statistics that you have to share with us since the launch of the app? We would love to know. Absolutely. Um, there's been some really interesting things that we've done. We released a report with UN Women UK that was looking, again, exactly at those uh, trends over different spaces. And it, what was really interesting was that we actually found that more reports were happening when um, that correlated with uh, peak congestion hours. This was before COVID hit. So basically meaning that when there were a large group of people, whether that's on a train or walking to the office, this was when we actually saw a lot of spikes of incidents. Um, so it could be, again, kind of the... Like we saw the the lunchtime hour, the the morning rush, and then the going um, home, and that I think again creates a really interesting and important um, piece of research that again we can look at in a lot more detail because I think there's a lot of myths around um, different experiences, um, particularly around street harassment or maybe gender based violence, 
that might kind of give a myth that it only happens in dark alleyways with strangers and, you know, people that, um, you know, monsters of our creation. And actually, it's a lot more of a normalized day to day experience that many people have. Uh, we also looked at um, what forms of harassment um, were the most common and by far it was verbal harassment. Um, but when we we do have a way of reporting, um, so you can pick a category and then you can elaborate on it. And when people do elaborate on it, there's such richness and we can see there's so many intersectional issues that are also raised. So it might start as a, a sexual comment and then go into a racial comment. Um, and again, could be escalated from there. So even though, again, it might be simplified to say it was a, a verbal harassment, the threat was really there or potentially it did escalate to an actual touch or grope. So it's, again, super important that we document these because in general, um, there is such a lack of information here. Um, it's not um, or hasn't really been classified as a, as a violent crime or as a crime kind of that um, has been prioritized until recently. And um, that's, again, we believe that collecting the spectrum of information on everyday experiences can help paint a better picture of how we can combat these um, and hopefully prevent more serious offenses from happening. Wow. That's really important to point out. And based on what you said about it could escalate from, you know, sexual comments to comments on these women's race and just it, it could be very traumatic. And do you have any resources for, you know, these women that could be going through these things to stay safe and for, you know, mental health? Absolutely. Uh, after these traumatic things happen. Yeah, it's it's so important. And what we've tried to design into Safe in the City is almost those safety tips along your journey so that you're just continuously, um, again, uh, being reminded of risks with uh, particular actions that you can take. So if it is um, a mobile phone hotspot of someone snatching your phone that Again, it's just a reminder to, hey, this is a hot spot. Put your phone away if you need directions, you know, put your back against the wall, make sure that you have peripheral vision. Um, so we've tried to make it very practical um, so that it, again, becomes something normalized in our kind of day to day experiences. And we become a lot more aware of the other people's needs in our space um, when we are when we are thinking about that as well. When it comes to um, mental health resources, we definitely have a number of partnerships um, that um, actually we just recently announced on International Women's Day. Um, so we're part of a global um, coalition against street harassment, which includes a number of fantastic organizations, including Hollerback, which is, um, I think, US-based, although they're in several countries, um, Safe City India, Think Oga Brazil, um, harass map Egypt um, and they also have a, a great number of resources uh, pertaining to different aspects. Um, Hollerback, for example, has some free training um, that's supported by L'Oreal Paris um, around street harassment and bystander training, whereas some of the other organizations might look at a little bit more around victim and, and trauma and how, again, we can support each other. But I think one of the key parts is actually how powerful it is to be able to verbalize and share your story. Um, and that's something that certainly brought us together because in part, you know, when when you don't realize an experience has happened, sometimes people get um, re-victimized if, say, you were groped on a, a train and it was crowded, you know, people clearly saw, but they looked away and didn't want to get involved. That can really be another level of, again, trauma to recognize no one's here to support me, or that could be the interpretation. So again, it's so important that when we're taking our own consideration of personal safety into effect, that we are simultaneously understanding different groups, perspectives and experiences. And we're all looking out for each other because if we want help in a situation, then we should be able to also be equipped to provide help. That's fantastic. Um, have you noticed 
like with with your data as you've been tracking um, violence and verbal harassment, things that are happening in, in the streets, um, any uh, increases in like racial violence or racial um, motivated uh, harassment where, because um, we've been seeing, as you know, like globally, we've seen an increase in anti-Asian racism. We've seen, especially here in the States, um, racism and trauma towards our black communities. And I'm kind of curious, like, as you've been kind of looking at the data during this pandemic, have you noticed any sort of increase with the types of harassments geared towards racial minorities? It's a great question. And it's something that we haven't specifically kind of collected any demographic information. So that's one of our kind of pillars is that we keep it anonymous. It's based on what you choose to share. Um, and we certainly have seen, um, as we said, kind of um, intersectional types of abuse that have happened. Um, and we know from other partners and um, experts in the space that there has been, you know, a surge of online abuse. Um, there's a great organization in the UK called uh, Glitch, and they've certainly looked at um, how um, men of color have had a very disproportionate experience of online abuse, which is quite startling. And again, kind of reflective, I think, in the public spaces. So I think, you know, as we're developing, um, we're certainly kind of keen to get involved in a lot more groups so that we can look at, you know, the complexity of how do we categorize, how do we, you know, help it be easier to report as sometimes you might not even know what category or terms, you know, these mean, especially for young people. So I think um, there's nothing I think I could, you know, give you a hard concrete number, but I do know that that has been increasing um, across different research and, and other bodies. So I, I do think that that is kind of a, an important area that we really take an intersectional approach to, again, kind of street harassment in general, but also other safety concerns of different groups. Definitely, Jillian. And stopping violence against girls and women is extremely crucial. And I absolutely love what you are doing. And I really hope that someday this goes on a global scale, your application. I'm not sure if you're working on that, but wow. Like when I say that, when I first, you know, read about what you're doing, I was just very, very touched. And I just want to know if you have any examples you could tell us about of how women are using your app to stay safe. Yeah. What, what is happening now? Yeah. So we did again, see like a, quite a reduction, but now with, um, unfortunately there was a incident in the UK where a really tragic murder of a, a young woman, um, called Sarah Everard, who, um, was walking home late, um, and was actually murdered by a police officer. Um, and it really helped set, I think, the stage for a lot of women to come forward and to share that they also don't feel safe, whether it's walking at night or being alone or different experiences that this is kind of triggered for them. And I think it's really put a lot of the spotlight on how much we don't understand about the issues. Um, so we have seen, um, we had about uh, a huge, huge surge of downloads, um, as well as a number of other kind of apps that pertain to women's safety. Um, so we had about 25,000 in the last um, month, and that really spurred us to, um, to also launch uh, throughout the UK. We are looking at the US. It was something that we were doing in late 2019, but we had to pause kind of um, things with COVID, but we're certainly always looking for partners, um, especially kind of city police um, organizations that um, can, you know, work with this type of information, geospatial information to look at how do we design solutions um, a lot more effectively. Um, but we have seen a lot more reports coming in um, across now the UK, which has been really interesting. And we also ran um, as part of our, our, I guess, our birthday or our third anniversary, um, a Build Back Safer campaign. We launched um, a number of survey. Um, well, we launched a survey with a number of really interesting results that 
was looking at um, people's experiences of personal safety on their top five mobile apps. So whether that's Uber or Google Maps or, you know, Tinder, it was looking at, okay, when you're connecting um, online to a physical location, what kind of experiences have you had? And we saw a really big, um, I guess, a correlation between women and people who are identified uh, from the LGBTQ community that tech um, the mobile apps that they were using actually weren't doing enough to consider their personal safety while they were connecting with people in these spaces. Um, and we also saw that about 80% of people um, said that they would want, you know, location specific information related to their, you know, risks or potential emergencies. And I feel like it's starting to become, at least in the UK, there's a um, a movement of kind of safety tech and really understanding, you know, the spectrum of how online abuse can, you know, can facilitate offline abuse, how, again, how our devices can act as really important ways to deliver information, but also collect information ethically. And again, how that can really help shape and create a lot more of a representative group of um, information and, um, you know, what what's going on in these cities or what other areas or communities can be engaged to have a better picture of things. Yeah. I feel like what's also wonderful about your app is that you're, you're able to gather data to show trends because I, when I think about all the important data that your app is collecting, it's like the tip of the iceberg, right? There's like so much that's unreported. There's so much trauma and hate speech. That's like people just like, oh, whatever. I've dealt with that my whole life. I'm not going to report it. It's just another day for me. And so people that are bold enough and have the courage, because it takes a lot of courage. Um, that's like the tip of the iceberg. That's just like, so it's able to show trending. And I'm kind of curious, like, as you kind of are looking at trending, um, especially in different places, um, are you also like, looking at like crimes in those areas and kind of seeing correlations? Yeah, we haven't, I guess, done kind of a, a deep dive into that, but we're working, um, there's a number of other cities that we're looking at rolling out to go into a little bit more depth of those correlations and, you know, walkability, um, you know, what are the perceptions? Are there differences in perceptions? The different um, types of mobility solutions is something uh, quite interesting with micro mobility becoming even more kind of um, important or looking at, you know, the 15 minute city of how you can get around versus kind of long commutes, the kind of maybe COVID world where we're a lot more based in our local areas. Um, to a lot more, a greater extent. Um, so that's something that we're certainly keen to look at. Um, and as you said, the it is that tip of the iceberg. And I think there's no one that's, you know, cracked it perfectly that we have all of the information related to all the types of abuses that people experience, which is part of why, again, it, we're looking at how do we work collaboratively with different organizations that are already collecting this information, whether it is collected on Instagram, but if there's a location, there's a description, there's, you know, a, an, a person behind it. Um, and how can we leverage what's already existed to, again, start plotting and understanding um, what what is going on in these spaces? Um, and then look for those solutions with um, experts in those areas as well. Like we can't necessarily go into a U.S. market, although I'm Canadian, I'm close second <laughs> neighbor, but, you know, I wouldn't know, you know, the ins and outs of California and your community as well as you would. So again, it's really plugging into the existing infrastructure community organizations that exist and how our tool or um, our APIs can work alongside that to, again, make this uh, you know, something that we're continuously um, understanding what's going on by collecting that information and, and measuring and, and monitoring that change. Can you talk about like the different ways that people can report things on the app? So for example, um, I've been, uh, as I've been going on trails, you know, during COVID-19, I've been spending a lot more time on trails 
And I've been noticing, unfortunately, like racist graffiti and hate speech on like trees and rocks. And so I, I always report them to the police. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like within the app, when people are wanting to report things, what are the different ways that people can signal that there's danger or um, violence here potentially? Yeah, that's that's great that you're reporting these, um, you know, types of graffiti and vandalism. Uh, so we've designed the app to have kind of a traffic light system. So we have kind of the physical types of um, assault or touching um, as well as stalking, because we know that that's highly correlated with other violent behaviors. Um, and then we have an amber, which is generally around kind of verbal, nonverbal uh, types of abuse, whether it's co sexual comments or whether it's uh, racial abuse or whether it's gestures and, and signals that are, again, quite offensive or disgusting in a lot of cases. Um, and then the environmental, so kind of a green of, yeah, those forms of, um, you know, what's in the environment that also is signaling um, different forms of harassment um, or, you know, taking photos, the kind of, uh, you know, leering and, and peeping Tom type of a behaviors that also exist. So, you know, we're trying to catch as many um, and fit it into kind of our, what we've, you know, designed and seems to be working, but it is something that we're adapting and um, looking at, or we're training a lot more machine um, learning algorithms on this type of data set. So potentially we don't have to have people, um, you know, select categories. They can free text into uh, different forms and then we can try to make sense um, and categorize and, you know, have humans <laughs> involved in understanding that because again, it, there's so many elements um, that we're still really discovering of, you know, what forms of abuse or what level of severity, again, a, a comment of maybe a whistling could be less severe than a threat of, I'm going to follow you home and rape you. Like, you know, there, there's a difference, even though technically it's just words um, or just sounds, it, it becomes something that we, we do know that there is a difference of those behaviors. And the more that we involved, you know, the people who lived these experiences and understand their impacts um, or the changes of their mobility patterns or where they go and, and spend time or shop or go out at night, then the better that we can actually, you know, design solutions that can go into those nitty gritty details to prevent those things from happening. That is phenomenal that that option is there for these women. They could just type in, this is happening, and you guys collect that data. So with that data being collected, at what point is there action based on like what these women are reporting? It's an urgent situation where this person is in physical danger, you know, and they, they need help. Is there like um, an emergency service or is it more of like, this is how you guys collect the data so that more women are aware that in these areas, there's more crime? It's a great question. And we did include um, our kind of emergency number. Um, it's within the app that you click right away. It's the biggest button that you can find on the toolbar, um, which is directly connects you to 999 over here but 911 in the US. Um, and it does come with your location. So you can, again, kind of give information right away if you're not sure where you are. Um, but in terms of alerting other people or sending kind of a security team, we don't have that um, capability. Um, but we do work alongside police so that the the numbers and that, again, those aggregated trends over different spaces does go back to them so that they can look at how do, might we design, you know, more officers in this area or potentially, again, some more of their solutions. Um, but again, we equally want um, that to be, you know, in the form of a business and communities. So it's not um, only on the police. We know that this is a collective effort for us to all, you know, be safe and keep each other safe. Um, so I guess that's kind of a, a key um, aspect of, of what we do. Um, and with, again, our um, APIs um, integrating into more apps, again, we, we want that demand of kind of safety and understanding of personal safety to just be 
a part of our digital and you know interconnected lives versus um, something that you know we might have to buy you know bells and whistles and pepper spray or weapons like or you know self-defense which you know some of which are <laughs> a lot more effective I would go against weapons but um, yeah I think that's something that um, we also try to uh, train and, and deliver information on kind of being street smart, street aware, um, to help kind of combat different situations. But, you know, it's not necessarily, it's not anyone's fault if anything happens to them, but it's taking precautions just like everyone else. Um, and again, recognizing the risks in your area. A hundred percent. Uh, Jillian, I love what you're doing. I can't stress it enough. <laughs> and I also, I just want to ask you about your i3 intelligence platform that you recently launched. If you could tell us more about it and what people should know about it, please. Definitely. So yeah, all of that um, great tech that our team has built and developed over the years, um, we're basically making it available to other um, mobile apps to be able to deliver that same uh, level of kind of safety and duty of care to their users on their platforms. And I think that this is, again, um, something that has more traditionally been maybe a customer service, um, very much kind of um, a one you know product, one solution, um, maybe a bit of a black box of, okay, I've reported it. Did they get back to me? Was this the service good enough? Like, will that vary on a totally different platform, which Again, those kind of, um, if it's not good in this experience, then why would it be better in this one? And that being a really key thing that we also need to pay attention to um, as if, again, there's, um, you, you report it just like if you experience something and maybe you reported it to the police once, uh, maybe a groping, and perhaps they didn't take it seriously, then, you know, that has a, a ripple effect of whether you would report in the future, potentially. Um, so I, I think, you know, by taking that collective um, responsibility, but also recognition that these can happen in all types of spaces, then it does create, um, you know, a lot more of a building of trust and transparency that, hey, we're working on this together. This is um, you know, a larger societal problem against different kind of groups that have disproportionate um, forms of violence. Um, that's not to, you know, hierarchy and say this is not an important group. This is they're all important. We just some of people need different focuses. And we've tried to focus a lot more on um, underrepresented groups, uh, particularly women. Um, so yeah, you can check out our app, um, or sorry, you check out our website, um, and we have the I3 and I risk. So they're again around emergency or just the general risk. And we've seen some really um, great things. We just launched it um, just over a month ago, and um, again, lots of um, safety applications that are seeing the value to offer, you know, insight into perhaps where um, they might be headed to their date. Um, or even again, kind of where might you park, you know, your, your bike or your, your scooter in particular areas, like where have the tr trends of crime been or other types of vandalism and experiences like that. So we see a really, um, we think that we're really at just the start of this, of even other applications. And again, that kind of ability to build um, safety into our mobile apps and how that can, again, drive information and collaboration so that we can monitor these risks and be more equipped to deal with them. That's super cool. I'm curious, like, as you've been like brainstorming and thinking about all the ways that your data could be used to help out so many companies and, th and government institutions, what are some things you're thinking about that you're really excited about on how companies could leverage this data through I3? I think what we've always wanted, you know, we're a social um, business or a mission-driven business. So we, we do care about the impact that we're having, which is why we've designed, again, our solution around this undocumented area and safety being something we believe everyone should have a right to. Um, so, you know, our app hasn't been um, something that anyone pays for. It's always been in kind of our consulting and now our, our I3. 
so we're really excited that um, you know other people are seeing the potential of what it can do for their businesses. And I think particularly looking at it as, hey, there can be a benefit of, of addressing violence again against women for like also a commercial benefit. You know, if for example there's a you know lower barrier or there's less you know women taking a particular um, you know journey with them a, a share like a car share then you know what can you do to help address those safety barriers um, so that you can you know increase the number of people paying customers for example uh, we also think that there's a lot around kind of your reputation and there's um, you know a lot more to be said about um, customers really demanding or, or wanting to see more than just kind of Oh, we we do this. It's like okay, no, show me how you're you're uh, green and environmental, or show me how you employ um, your people equally, or your you pay equally. And I think again, we we want um, that to be a type of a standard going forward. Um, so there's I think a lot of that we can you know really dive into and we're always looking at you know how can we also build really best practices around those organizations we're not naming and, and blaming any particular organization it's probably when you turn a blind eye and say no, it doesn't happen here that you're going to be in more trouble in the long term than you know going hey we don't really know what's going on and we do need to find that out and this is a proactive way that we can quickly turn um, an incident or you know a series of incidents into a positive that we can really show how we're helping I was reading your press release Jillian and uh, was reading news about misogyny being treated as a hate crime in the UK which is awesome I was curious about um, uh, you know I'm here in the US but I'm curious about in the UK how has this like bill been received is it I'm not even sure it's called a bill but how is that perceived in the UK and how is that impacting your work on the app? Yeah, it's it's great uh, question, and it's something that we've been involved with for uh, some time. We were one of the organizations supporting. There was, I think, twenty five of us um, that were also trying to support um, this uh, MP to take this bill forward. It is a bill, <laughs> and um, it was passed in an experimental phase. So basically it's um, going into law for a period of time to see how it works. It has been uh, piloted successfully in particular cities, including Nottingham, um, and a certain number of police forces do start collecting information on all forms of misogyny, including street harassment. And with our work in London and with the police there, we're really excited that again, that this information be treated quite um, as, a, a, as a priority and that more organizations really need the capability to monitor these risks and understand them better because they are passing into more of a criminal um, offense. So I think it does give, um, you know, women or, you know, any other group a lot more um, feeling that there is progression, that there is in the criminal justice, a recognition of these types of experiences. And that, you know, through campaigning and different, um, you know, communication campaigns and, and, you know, partnership work and research, you know, it, it really is showing that this is a, a very common normalized experience. Um, there was recently just last month, a report by UN Women UK that showed 97% of uh, young women, I think 18 to 24, had experienced some form of street harassment. Um, and this is, you know, again, quite a normalized experience. And if we don't know, you know, the impacts of that on a particular person, whether it's a, a young girl at a university and how that might affect her spending or where she feels safe um, traveling or, you know, does she need to be around other people? Does she need her partner to, you know, walk her to and from the station? I think we don't realize the extent of how this ripple affects into all sorts of our lives, whether it's family members, whether it's partners, there, you know, all of us have lived experiences that can't be someone else's, but if we don't join and 
join in and and understand um, the impacts it has on our lives to also be empathetic to other people, then I think we're just going to keep going in circles. And I think, again, this is a very important uh, recognition um, as, you know, transgender, homophobic behavior, racial groups, religious groups, disability, they've all been kind of recognized as forms of hate, but, you know, the form of, of being a woman and having uh, targeted hate hasn't really been recognized until now. Um, and we recently, um, actually today, had um, a horrible incident in Manchester where a young woman and her early 20s was gang raped in a park um, just simply by walking home. And again, this is just it's shocking, but this is an epidemic of, of sorts. And that's how I've become so passionate about this and treating it as a crisis, as, you know, again, almost a disease of how do we look at the spectrum of symptoms so that we know where to cut off the cancer earlier than, you know, waiting for something potentially like this to happen. Um, because these behaviors of, of people will follow them. They're not, you know, one-off rare events you don't go from never having anything to you know some part participating in something like that so again um that is kind of our perspective on how understanding that that spectrum of violence is really important 100 percent. wow and for those people who don't understand maybe the repercussions of harassment of misogyny things like that. What, what do you have to say to those, those critics, the people who are opposed to this bill that was passed? I think, you know, a lot of, I feel like a lot of opposition comes from people who don't have the lived experiences and um, take their own perspective and project it on other people um, or minimize or, you know, gaslight kind of experiences to make it less serious. And I think, what I've been actively involved in and our team, and again, I think, you know, a lot of the people I prefer to spend my time with is, you know, how can we under better understand each other's experiences? Um, and I think from learning from the Black Lives Matter and the violence that Black people in the UK, the US, all over have experienced, you know, it really connects the dots of how much we need to be active allies versus have an identity of, well, I'm not a misogynist. I've never, you know, harmed a woman, but that can create apathy of, you know, an identity that you're not involved because you've just identified yourself and kind of given yourself an excuse versus what are the behaviors that make you actively involved against human rights violations, against violence. And I think the more that we're turning that, um, turning to that perspective, the more effective we'll be at um, understanding, um, you know, all people's safety is important. Um, it's not that we lose out when we build solutions for more vulnerable groups or have that designed into, you know, our tech solutions, which generally don't have them designed into. So I think, you know, people need to take that larger perspective of, you know, why do we need this? Because again, these stats that are almost at 100% and run by super credible organizations, you know, study after study, decade after decade, there's really not a volume of evidence that we can say that these aren't real issues that are happening. And I think it's really that perspective shift that needs to happen. Fantastic. Well, Jillian, I can't believe our hour is up. Um, for those listening in, uh, data scientists or business leaders that would like to get involved, they want to know, like, what are some of your needs? What are ways that we can partner with you? Um, what would be some things you can share with them to let them know uh, about ways they can get involved? Yes. So uh, please uh, check out our website. We have a lot more information, some of our research available there, um, safeinthecity.com. We're quite active on um, social media. I would say personally, I'm, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So if you want to reach me on there, uh, you can certainly find me. Um, 
And yeah, I think if you're working towards a sustainable development goal on, you know, uh, gender equality, on sustainable cities, on uh, reducing inequalities, then we're certainly probably a great fit um, to work on these large problems that exist in all types of spaces and how do we really accelerate the change that's needed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jillian, for being on Data Talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Data Talk podcast. We share new shows every week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes, including YouTube videos, on our Experian News blog. You can get access to the full catalog by going to experian.com slash data talk. And we always love hearing from our community, so if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows or guests you'd like to hear from, please let us know. You can leave a comment on iTunes, or you can reach out to us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab. You can also email me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care, and we'll chat next week.